when I was thinking about introducing John, I was thinking back to when I first met him. Um, it was at a conference, a small conference, that was uh, looking at the New Economics Foundation's Happy Planet Index. And I, I ran into John and I chatted with him. And then I asked my friend Marjorie Kelly, do you know who he is? And she said, yeah, he's a finance guy who's focused on sustainability. And I thought to myself, that's got to be right up there with giant shrimp. <laughs> but it turns out to be exactly right. He is a finance guy. He started out at J.P. Morgan. He spent 18 years there. He retired from that as a managing director. He's done many other things in the finance area since then. But they've progressively moved to include broader and more uh, uh, far-reaching concerns. So for example, he's involved in impact investing where the criteria for the investment is not just the return, but rather it's the return and the social benefit that the investment might create. Um, he's the founder and president of the Capital Institute, which is a major organization focusing on an, a resilient, just, and sustainable economic system. Uh, he's worked with the TELUS Institute. There'll be a paper coming out which you'll find on our website in due course about finance for a finite planet, where rather than thinking that the possibilities for finite for the finance are boundless, he'll talk about how they're quite bounded and what the bound should be. Uh, today, John is going to talk to us about finance for a regenerative economy. And if he doesn't tell you what a regenerative economy is by the end of his talk, you could be asking him in the, co in the question period. So, John, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, I first have to apologize. I've been suffering from a bit of a cold, so I hope my nasal voice is, um, is, is not too obnoxious. Um, I also have to start with a, a real um, uh, expression of gratitude. Uh, someone left the soap in the shower this morning. <laughs> and um, that was a, um, a welcome surprise. And, and in the spirit of paying it forward, I left my little shampoo bottle. Um, so uh, it's always good to be in, in dorm life. I have two kids in college, and, and uh, I kind of knew what I was in for. I, I came with my sleeping bag. and. Fortunately, that wasn't necessary. So anyway, it is great to, great to be here, and thank you, John, for, um, for inviting me. Um, John's very, very um, stealth. He noticed that I snuck the word regenerative economy in, and of course, that's a whole nother talk, and, um, and we're actually having a little meeting next week in New York to talk about what that means. So I'm going to try to duck that a little bit, but I did want to at least put the meme out there and, uh, and hope that it begins to catch, and, and we'll talk about it a bit. Um, what I do intend to talk about today is, is really finance and in the context of sustainability and, in, and it's a very interesting, in my mind, juxtaposition between looking at sustainability through a consumption lens, which of course is what you're all uh, doing and, and here to talk about. Um, I look at the issue through a finance lens and, uh, and in particular through an investment lens and, uh, and so the the heart of, of my talk really is about this investment lens, but I'll first set some context, talk about some of the issues that you're all uh, very familiar with, at least share some of my perspectives on them, um, and then talk a little bit about money and banking uh, as distinct from the investment uh, process itself. So, you know, uh, when I left JP Morgan, I always like to get this in early, in 2001, um, before all the really bad stuff started to happen, so you can't blame me. Um, I, I, I sensed a, really a, a, a voice inside myself saying, I don't want to do this anymore. But it was, um, it was sort of trite compared to what's happened in the financial world since then. It, it kind of reminds me how my parents must have felt when they first heard the Beatles singing rock and roll. You know, it's, it had, if only they knew what was going to follow, they would have been really horrified. Um, but, um, but really, having had the time to step away from finance, from Wall Street, 
And I was right in the thick of it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I was a derivatives professional. I was what I like to call the first generation derivatives um, uh, professionals back in the, in the mid 80s. And derivatives and securitization were, were really uh, important innovations that transformed the way finance works. And, and had many productive applications. And what's happened since then really is it's become a tool that's been abused and misused really just for as a speculative, as a le highly leveraged speculative instrument. And, uh, and we've seen the results of that. But, um, but when I left Morgan, I started uh, sort of a period of real re-education. Um, I started reading a lot of the books that I'm sure you all have, have read. And, uh, and it, it really kind of had this rolling epiphany about how misguided our understanding of the world was from the perch of Wall Street. And uh, of course, no one says it better than Wendell Berry. Um, our, our economy has become a financial system and a financial system without economic virtues. And I think that, that pretty much uh, says it all. So about these competing uh, world views, um, two years ago, The Economist, this was a cover in The Economist magazine, I don't know if, if you all remember it. Of course, the article didn't quite say what probably all of us would have wanted it to say. It kind of sees this as a great new opportunity and man was now in charge to manage the planet, not just our lives and our businesses and our families. And of course, we've proved to be really good at managing our lives, our businesses and our families, so why not manage the planet? Um, but, um, but this is different and, and one of the problems in the, in the, uh, the competing world views is that most people on Wall Street and in the elite economics profession are looking at the current situation as if it's another cycle and they're looking historically at what happened last time and what worked and how, what policies we apply but there isn't really any context that suggests that we're entering something different, something new which of course, I don't need to tell all of you. Um, and, and a nice little way to, to sort of present this in a, in a, in a little uh, diagram is this is sort of how the world looks from Wall Street. There's, there's raw materials on the planet, and, and we don't even really understand about the waste sinks because that's, that's too technical. Um, and we process raw materials into our economy, um, and, and then the economy is sort of driven by finance, which, which kind of through its allocation of capital, in this miraculous invisible hand way um, sorts out how best to allocate resources in a way that maximizes profit for the financiers. And, and that's efficient. And th that is the world view. And there's not, th that's, not an, that's not a moral or ethical statement. That's just the way people think. And of course, um, there seems to be something wrong with that. And, um, and by the way, that slide, I needed a lot of help to make that work. So. <laughs> Um, you won't get a lot of those. Uh, but obviously this is, this is the way we need to think about finance, really as a servant to a regenerative economy that is in the context or embedded in the planet. And of course, if you wanted to make the slide more complicated, you'd add another layer, which is society or people, um, civilization, which would obviously fit between the economy and the planet. The economy is there to serve people, not, um, not uh, to serve finance. Um, and, and then secondly, we, we um, you know, an another thing that is completely unconsidered, I should say it's being considered now only after the financial crisis, but economics and particularly finance is all about efficiency. And um, uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, our leading banker now, uh, in his annual report, gave a very uplifting message to his shareholders and he, he talked about America's great strengths. The first one was um, uh, the U.S. has the strongest military in the world. That was in the annual report. Um, and then the second, or it might have been the third one, is that we have the most liquid, most efficient capital markets in the world. As if that's, you know, the achievement of, of a great country is to have liquid, efficient capital markets. And it, it's, an, it's evidence that we are confused about the purpose of finance and, the, um, and, the, and this issue of what are the means and what are the ends. And so we pursue this idea of efficiency to an extreme. And, and globalization, securitization, derivatives, um, all of that is a, is a means to increase efficiency. But we've lost track of this idea of resiliency, which, which system scientists understand.
And, and this, um, this chart uh, comes from uh, uh, Bernard Leotard's work. And um, I just, when I first saw it, it, it really resonated because it, it seems like we're all about moving over there to the, my left, your right. And, um, and of course, what we need to do is find this balance where uh, systems balance efficiency and resiliency. So for example, you know, a phone network or the internet, um, it would be much more efficient if you simply had a point-to-point -point communications system. But of course, the internet is resilient because it moves around nodes all over the planet. That's probably less efficient, but it is more resilient and therefore the internet doesn't collapse when there's a, um, when there's a break in, in one of the critical nodes. So um, just in summary on, the, on this worldview thing, I think you know, my frustration and frankly the reason I started Capital Institute is because all of the conversations about financial reform are all in the context of this old worldview. This worldview that how do we constrain the bankers, how do we regulate banking, what's the trade-off between regulation and free markets, and none of it is in the context of the Anthropocene, the, the age when you know, humans' impact on the planet will determine the course of the health of the planet and therefore the course of civilization. That conversation, frankly, hasn't even really started in the power circles that make decisions and, and as I say, the people who run the world. Um, so that's a, that's a daunting challenge and that is the reason that I, I set off to start Capital Institute as a, at just as a beginning, as a place where we can collaboratively begin to think about these issues through the lens of finance. So let me talk a little bit about the issues that you're all familiar with. Um, you know, this one doesn't really require a lot of, um, of, of, of expansion, although it's, it's shocking to me how little we've really moved forward, even after we've put some of the real bad guys in jail. And by the way, when I was in the business, I was in the equities business in the 90s, Bernie Madoff's business was, was very innovative and thriving. No one that I knew of had any idea that he was running a Ponzi scheme. Uh, he, was, he was famous because he introduced electronic market making and was, was paying for order flow in trading of equities. And that made him controversial. And some thought that was unethical. But that was nothing, nothing at all, had nothing at all to do, that was his legitimate business and had nothing to do with the Ponzi scheme. And so the reason I raise that is that today we have uh, I don't know if you guys have been following the, the trials and tribulations of a, of a hedge fund called SAC Capital. Um, it's, it's run by a, a guy named Stevie Cohen. When I was in the business over 10 years ago, the reputation and, and, and um, his reputation on Wall Street was that his firm was massively involved in insider trading as a core strategy. Um, getting inside information out of contacts, leads, paying for information from the street. That was sort of just understood as the reason why his financial returns were so spectacular. And now I think nine people have been indicted, four are, uh, have pleaded guilty, and, uh, and the firm has, has settled for $600 million. They're still in business, and in a recent New York Times article, uh, one of the investors in SAC Capital had this to say. This is a, um, a fund of hedge funds, meaning a, a pooling of capital, largely probably high net worth individuals who invest in hedge funds. And, uh, and this is what he had to say um, in the New York Times, uh, he, you know, for attribution. I'm very comfortable and confident having my money with him, meaning Stevie Cohen. Said Ed Bafowski, managing partner at Chapwood Investments in Dallas, a firm that invests client money in SAC. All I know is that the returns are coming in nice and my clients are happy. And the reason I, I mention that is that that doesn't even, that didn't even get sort of notice in the article. Um, and and, and I, I ran into some friends recently at a party who had also recently left Wall Street and, and, and this guy in particular is much closer to the inside of what's happening uh, than I am these days. And, and he, you know, I, I can't even repeat some of the things he said about how, um, how far the business has moved into just this basic, you know, free-for-all of, of insider trading that, you know, we're seeing some people um, getting, uh, getting caught and even some going to jail, but there, there isn't this sort of um, outrage that this has become the norm in the business. 
Uh, now that's mostly in the equity and high yield bond hedge fund world. That doesn't really apply to the big banks. But I just throw it out as a as a warning that we're you know we haven't really learned the lessons, the, the ethical lessons yet. I think of um, of the recent financial crisis. Then of course there's ideology. This ties directly into the worldview thing. Um, uh, I, I think the, you know, it's remarkable how few people in finance have really questioned whether the invisible hand is actually true. Um, it, it's just sort of ingrained in their, in, their, in their paradigm, in their way of thinking, in their belief system. And so, yeah, there were problems, but fundamentally free markets are the path to prosperity. Um, isn't that what uh, that guy Kudlow says on his show? Free markets are the path, best path to prosperity or something like that. So again, we, we have some fundamental ideology uh, retooling to do, and uh, we're really in the early stage of that process. Uh, again, I don't need to tell you about the arrogance uh, on Wall Street. You know, I worked at JP Morgan for almost 20 years. There is no CEO that I knew that I worked for or that I knew of prior to my time there, even in a joke, would have said in a public forum, sort of shooting down a question, that's why I'm richer than you, which, which this gentleman did say. Um, it, it is actually shocking even to someone who's used to that culture, um, what's happened um, on Wall Street. But, but most importantly is the ignorance. And this I don't mean in a, in a malicious way, I mean it in a factual way. Uh, and again, this, this issue of people that run the financial institutions and run the financial system are, are so busy doing what they do that they haven't had the chance to pull back and really think more deeply about the, um, the fact that this time is different and what the implications of that might be um, for finance. I don't know if you can read that. Um, can everyone read that? It's a little small. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. That was from Darwin. Um, and, I, and I think this ignorance is really the danger that, um, that I'm most focused on and that I think we should all be most concerned about. Uh, it's not the bad behavior and the arrogance and whatnot, although those are connected. It's really the, the fundamental ignorance in finance about the connection of finance and the biosphere. I think we understand better now the connection of finance to all of the social crises that we're seeing falling out, but I think very few people um, are really trying to process the, the implications of, of, um, of the connection of finance and finite limits and, and, um, and whatnot that you're all so familiar with. Um, obviously the consequences, social breakdown. This is the one I uh, like to focus on. I, I wrote a little blog, um, it's over a year ago now, uh, in response or, or, or having read a, an interesting report called the Carbon Tracker out of the UK. And uh, I called the, the report the $22 trillion big choice. And, and this piece was done by Think Progress which did a nice infographic on it. And the idea here is that uh, the big uh, circle on the left is uh, the amount of gigaton, gigatons of carbon we've burnt from the beginning of the fossil fuel era till 2000. Since from 2000 to 2010, we burned another 321. Note the scale of that 10 year period versus all of prior time. And then the big red circle on the right is the estimate of all of the gigatons of carbon embedded in the fossil fuels that we've already discovered. So these fossil fuels are on the balance sheets of Exxon and and BP, they're, they're implicitly on the balance sheets of Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Canada, uh, and all the other major um, sovereign oil producing um, enterprises. And uh, the point, the punchline is that if we're going to stay below the two degree warming threshold, and this is based on research done by the Potsdam Institute probably five years ago now, didn't get much um, uh, headlines when it came out that I'm aware of, but the Carbon Tracker report drew on that research and really put it into the mainstream now. Um, and, and frankly, the you know estimating the two degree threshold is all about statistics and probabilities. And as a finance person, you know when we have 95% confidence, we have things like the recent financial crisis. And the confidence intervals used in the Potsdam report are way below 95% confidence. So you know, probably these numbers are dramatically understated in terms of what we should be doing. 
Um, but the punchline of, of the Potsdam work was that we need to leave the vast majority, uh, depending on what confidence interval you use, the vast majority of the fossil fuel reserves we've already discovered in the ground. Or we're going to go right through the two degree threshold. And I calculated using a very rough back of the envelope method that those reserves, coal, oil, natural gas, at current market values, meaning if those reserves were sold from one company to another company, they'd be worth about $22 trillion. Now in context, the recent subprime mortgage crisis, the actual losses, direct losses from that crisis, <coughs> excuse me, were $2.7 trillion. And the $22 trillion is, I'm sure, understated. So we're talking about an economic um, event that's ten times in orders of magnitude the, um, the subcrime crisis. And, and the reason I call this financial overshoot is that because of our flawed worldview and ideology, there's embedded in the capital markets a presumption that we will just keep growing exponentially and therefore burning all of these carbon uh, fossil fuels and therefore these assets are real economic assets on the balance sheets and in our 401k portfolios. And if you juxtapose, if, if you insert the po proposition that well maybe we can't grow exponentially forever and most importantly we can't burn all these fossil fuels, then we've got a financial asset valuation problem in orders, you know, ten times the order of magnitude of the financial asset valuation problem we had with the subprime crisis. And we saw what that did. Now this is just one example in fossil fuels. If you think about the debt capacity um, of, of any government, the, the core assumption one makes is, well, what's the long-term growth rate of that na national economy to determine its debt capacity and to determine what's a reasonable debt to GDP ratio? This is an interesting chart. There's a lot of information on here, and I apologize for the noise. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that the financial assets as a percentage of GDP we're growing pretty steadily for a very long time until about 1980. Actually about 1982, that's when I went to work on Wall Street. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so it is maybe all my fault. And then something changed. And all of a sudden the growth of financial assets took off. Now, one thing to note on this chart is the bottom dark blue, that's deposits. And there's a lot of discussion in the sustainability community now around banking and, and the money supply and, and you know, the embedded uh, interest in debt and all that. What's driving this is not really the growth in the money supply and the growth in debt. The, the, the deposits are money and, and deposits as a percentage of GDP have remained fairly stable. What's changed is the financialization, the, the Wall Street um, uh, securitization and just securitization of assets. You know, more and more private companies went public, more and more private assets, more and more assets got privatized, and then more and more securities were created using leverage. And so you saw, particularly in the second, you know, it's, it's the equities and the, and the private debt, which is all the securities that has really exploded this. And, and so we, you have to raise the question, well, how much of that, those assets and the values of those assets, those assets will exist, they just may not be worth what they're currently worth on everyone's balance sheets and in everyone's 401k plan if we were to suddenly realize that the global economy can't grow exponentially. Because all of those assets are valued based on some growth assumption and I'm pretty confident that that growth assumption is higher than what the long-term growth rate will turn out to be. So this idea of ecological overshoot to me translates directly to a, a corollary of, of, um, of financial overshoot. Um, we've got, in addition to what I just described, we've got whatever it's going to cost us to quote fix the ecosystem function we've broken. Um, there's a massive off balance sheet debt associated with that, whether that's involved in uh, replanting, reforest, replanting forests, uh, restoring the grasslands, healing the ocean. Uh, all of this is going to cost money. Obviously the climate change, the storms, the, the insurance costs associated with that are only building. That's, that's essentially an off-balance sheet liability of our global economic system, global economy that's linked directly to ecological overshoot. That's not factored into 
um, you know, our, our balance sheets yet. Um, you know, the, the price earnings multiple, PE, price earnings multiple, the valuation of equity markets themselves. Forget about the oil stocks. What about all the stocks that are based on an, an assumption of perpetual growth? Um, I would argue that the stock market is actually already beginning to discount the, um, the constraints on growth ahead of the smart people that supposedly are telling us how to invest our money. Um, I, and I think that will continue. Uh, I mentioned earlier the debt capacity of nations and finally all of our pension plans. Um, and there's a huge problem in this country about unfunded pension liabilities. And of course, the calculation of how big that unfunded pension liability is is all predicated on a core assumption about long-term economic growth. Um, so we have we have lots of <laughs> we have lots of uh, challenges that coming to a realization of what the Anthropocene really means uh, is going to have in the world of finance. And of course, on the, on one level, I had a I, I gave a talk recently, and, and a gentleman asked or, or came up to me afterward and he said, you know, none of this really matters except to you rich people. And you know. She had a point. Most of the financial assets are owned by the rich people. But of course, as we've seen in the subprime crisis, the feedback loops of the dislocation of the financial markets into the real economy is, is overwhelmingly the bigger impact of a financial market dislocation than is the actual loss uh, of, the, um, of, of the financial assets. In other words, the $2.7 trillion loss in the subprime crisis is trivial compared to the, you know, the pain and suffering of people, the explosion of uh, national balance sheets and, and long-term uh, sovereignty in countries like Greece. So it does, it, this is important to everybody. Now, I'm sorry, sorry to start you off on a, on a downer. I, I, I heard Bill McKibben give a talk recently and he starts out his talks by saying, well, I'm here to be the chief bummer outer. Um, <laughs> And so I'm, not, I'm hopefully not going to do that, but I, I did want to give you all the context that I look at and, um, and I think we need to be realistic about the, um, the challenges ahead of this transition into, um, into the Anthropocene. As I started out by saying, what I really want to focus us on is the, um, the investment lens and, and why this matters. And of course, GNP, and I'm not a fan of GNP, but GNP, our, our classic way of measuring the economy is is a, a, a function of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. You all are very focused correctly on consumption. I think in the United States that comprises 70% of GMP. What I want to talk about is investment because the investment decisions we make, I believe, drive the consumption decisions we make more than we may realize. If someone builds a plant that constructs Hummers, pretty soon there's going to be commercials out convincing all of us um, studly men that we need to be driving a Hummer rather than a, rather than a Volkswagen. So these are all connected. Um, but mostly the, the, um, the idea that compound interest is what drives investment decisions and, and you all can appreciate that compound interest at some point is fundamentally in conflict with the idea of a finite planet and the laws of thermodynamics and compound interest is what drives investment. So we have a systemic challenge here, which, um, which I'm not smart enough to figure out, um, but, I, but, I, but I am kind of raising some questions. And the first one is, if there are limits to growth, then not only are there limits to consumption, but I believe there are limits to investment. And certainly, it matters tremendously what we invest in. Um, we were talking at, at breakfast a little bit, and obviously there's a massive investment required to shift our energy system off of fossil fuels into, into some renewable forms. That's a massive, multi-decade uh, investment uh, requirement. We call those opportunities on Wall Street. Um, but at the same time, the aggregate amount of investment, which, which generates income and earnings, which then gets spent in consumption, probably needs to be somehow constrained if the planet is not itself expanding. That's a, that's a problem that is impossible to even tackle in the context of classic economics and, and certainly from the perspective of Wall Street where investment is always thought of as a good thing. We want more investment. Um, a quick comment on what I mean by investment. I'm talking about real investment, not financial speculation, not financial investment. 
So whether we all put our money in Fidelity or Schwab and they buy stock A or stock B, that has some importance because that does affect the cost of capital of these companies. But the real decisions that we need to understand and ultimately um, uh, engage with are the investment decisions of essentially the top 1,000 corporations, which make up over half the market value of, of the global public corporations, probably 50 financial intermediaries, the biggest banks and funds, and perhaps the G20 countries. Because the investment decisions of those actors, and there are very few of them in the scheme of the complex global economy, those are the ones that are actually going to determine the quality of the economic system that exists 10, 20 years from now. And they will determine um, the, um, uh, you know, the de degree to which the, the ecological challenges will either be uh, addressed or not. So, um, you know, unfortunately that means that all of our choices as retail investors, and, and there's a huge industry, and I, I, didn't, I don't want to talk a lot about this, we could spend a lot of time on it, um, but, you know, my own view is that all of this activity of responsible investing is incredibly properly intended, well-intended, insightful, um, but ultimately pushing on a broken system. Uh, you know, public corporations, securities, are not the way to control investment decisions of these big actors. At the government level, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a citizen obligation. What we have our governments invest in is our responsibility. And at the corporate level, unless a corporation is privately owned or privately controlled, you know, the best shareholders can do is show up at the annual meeting and scream about proxies. And that's a very different place to be than sitting around the board table, ideally with a controlling interest in the company, like private equity firms do. Those people control the investment decisions of these corporations. And until we have a different form of corporate ownership, we're not really going to be able to get control of those investment decisions the way we need to. Having said that, the, you know, I, I'm the last person to be critical of the responsible investment community. We're making progress, we're making strides, but people in that community will tell you it just doesn't feel like enough after 20, 25 years of, of, of hard effort. The latest, oh, and, and just as one example of the challenges of this ESG framework, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, and that's kind of the latest lingo in the socially responsible investment community, meaning we need to, we need to take account of and incorporate into our research uh, environmental governance and and social factors not just financial performance and Puma is one of the leaders um, uh, in this area they've been extremely transparent and producing what they call their ecological P&L EP&L and in 2010 the company earned uh, 202 million euros of, of, of profit reported profit gap or not gap but accounting profit and they disclosed for the first time that at the same time they cost the earth 145 million euros if they were to properly internalize the cost. And that's mostly driven by their use of water and their use of energy. And I asked Joachim why he didn't publish the report again in 2011 and he said well you know it's really driven by water and energy and there's not much we can really do about that certainly in the short term. So my point is that yes measuring all this stuff is important and transparency is important but the fundamental problem is that many, many businesses that we, that we take as ethical, perfectly valid businesses like Puma Sneaker Company operate in a way that is fundamentally inconsistent with a sustainable economy. And, and it's difficult to change. So I guess that gets back to the consumption side. If, if we consume the sneakers that we know have this cost to the planet, then Puma stays in business. If we somehow decide not to, it doesn't. But I think it's more complicated than that. I, I think the, you know, Puma makes investment decisions itself to expand its, its own business and then advertises to us as to what sneakers we buy. And so, uh, again, engaging at the level of the corporation and their investment decisions, I think, is a, it's not an either or. It's an incremental strategy that we need to pursue. Uh, the, the latest craze in the investment world is this idea of impact investing and you know I'm an impact investor I'm, I'm involved in a number of projects um, that are putting the purpose of the enterprise social and, and or environmental purpose as the 
the purpose of the company. Um, but now this has been somewhat hijacked again by the Wall Street ideology, and we've now view, we now view impact investment as a new asset class, a new opportunity, and we're not talking about changing the way we invest, you know, 99% of our capital. We have this new opportunity for a new asset class, and, you know, we, we have fancy diagrams like this that show the difference between philanthropy and investment, and impact investing kind of balances the two. That's great, but we're losing track of the key point, which is that all investment has impact. And so, uh, to me, the worst thing we could do is to succeed and create an impact investment industry and not go back and question the investments that Exxon are making and Puma are making and every other corporation and every other government is making, um, uh, which is really what's driving the real economy. So enough about investment. Um, a couple comments um, uh, on money and banking. Um, I, I've, um, I've got a lot of thoughts on this and I, I did some work on a, um, uh, on a sort of what would real financial reform look like and I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. But I've kind of put it on the shelf for a while because I believe until we shift the, the paradigm, the ideology within which we're thinking about these problems, my ideas will never even, I mean people look at me like, you know, what happened to you? Um, and so. Uh, my work, and that's why this regenerative economy idea is so important to me, until we shift into a different understanding of how the economy works, I think it will be very difficult to have the thoughtful and serious conversations we need about how to fix finance. The first issue is, you know, banking used to be understood as a profession. When I went to work at what was then called Morgan Guarantee Trust Company of New York, I think people used the word profession, banking as a profession. And there's a difference between a profession and a business. And that, that idea is absent today for sure. We just assume that it's a business and we assume that uh, bankers and shareholders and, and management have the right to make as much money as they can as long as it's legal. Um, and there is no sort of financial statesmanship and responsibility that used to exist in, in, um, in the financial sector, certainly when I grew up in it. Um, you know, I've talked earlier about the, the kind of structural problems of the money and banking system. Um, uh, it is all structured around growth and because of the, the idea of compound interest and the fact that money is created at interest or meaning when money is created, it's created because a bank makes a loan and a loan has interest associated with it. So by definition, the borrower of that money needs to do something productive with the money in order to pay back the money and the interest. So we are systematically locked into a growth system, but I believe that the money piece of this is, is actually at a lower level than the confusion we have around investment, but obviously the two are tied together. Um, here's, a, here's a quick little data um, dump for you. This is the balance sheet of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. Um, it's not something most people pay attention to, I don't think, um, but it's staggering. Before the financial crisis, the Fed had a trillion dollar balance sheet. And we could spend all day talking about what does that mean, does that matter, is a trillion high or is a trillion low? Well, a trillion seems high, but what really matters is it's now three trillion. And, um, and you can see the dark blue is all of the you know, quantitative easing, uh, QE. That's the Fed purchasing long maturity treasuries. And then the orange is the purchasing of mortgage securities. And the way the Fed does that is it essentially creates the money in a computer and buys securities in the marketplace. And that has a wonderful effect of increasing the valuation of long-term debt securities, which by definition means long-term interest rates go down. That's the reason they're doing it, to try to stimulate the economy. Well, now we're beginning to see the market and the practitioners begin to think about wh what happens when the Fed decides it doesn't need to keep doing this, and they're still buying these securities. There, there's this new term now called taper. It's not a new word, it's a new term in, in, the, in, the, in the lexicon of the Fed. And the Fed is beginning, or, or analysts are beginning to speculate about the Fed tapering off the new purchases of securities. And that's what's caused the turmoil in the financial markets over the last couple of weeks. It's just the speculation about the Fed slowing down the purchases, let alone unwinding and selling all these assets into the capital markets. So we're, we're, we're in a position where we're, uh, again, I think this ties directly into this financial overshoot. We're, 
we're hyping up the economy predicated on this hope that we can grow our way out of this and we now have the Fed, the central banks around the world loaded up in these assets trying to make this happen which if that growth doesn't materialize these assets um, you know the, the, the sovereignty of the countries that issue these assets um, comes into question and, and we could have a you know, have a, have a real train wreck. This is the sum of all the central banks. I know you can't read it, but the Fed is at the bottom. The um, European Central Bank is the, is the next green up and, and the big green up uh, uh, higher than it is China. Uh, but again, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little unnerving. Um, I don't think anyone really understands, because it's never happened before, how this, how this play is going to end. Um, but obviously, you can't just have central banks continuously buying financial assets forever. Um, some people argue we can do that for a long, long time and there's no reason to worry. I hope they're right. I don't, I don't honestly know. Um, but getting to financial reform, uh, you know, what, what would I, you know, through, through a sustainability lens, what would I suggest? I think, first of all, Dodd-Frank is, you know, lots of good progress but fundamentally has been taken over by the, the special interests and is being you know, negotiated to death and, and watered down and it, it will make some improvements. It's certainly causing a lot of headaches for banks, which is probably a good thing, um, but it's fundamentally not changing the issues that, um, uh, that, that I think we need to be concerned about. Um, uh, you know, in summary, the, the financial system remains too big relative to the economy. It's too complex and interconnected. It's not resilient, it's efficient, not resilient. It's, it's resilient only because of the big balance sheet support that it's getting from the central banks. That's the wrong kind of resiliency. We need a, an organic or a natural resiliency that, that, that system scientists understand how we can create. Um, and it doesn't generate the outcomes we need. I'm gonna run short on time, so I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, uh, but, but to me, there's 10 key things we need to do. And I, I wrote this now about a year ago, and I think these are still um, pretty accurate. As I was preparing for this, I said, yeah, that sounds about right. So we need to fix the mortgage mess and the student loan mess. Um, that means writing off and writing down assets. There's other creative things can be done, but fundamentally there's a, there's a need to deal with reality there. Um, we need to stop subsidizing debt. Uh, if, if growth and debt is a problem, why do we subsidize debt with, um, uh, with interest deductions for corporations and for mortgages? Not every country does that. Uh, we need to wall off the insured depositors, make banks banks again. Uh, we need a, um, a very onerous um, capital and tax regime that disincentivizes scale and complexity. And that, that would be hard to structure, but conceptually it's quite simple. We want to, we want to, banks respond to, to rules and regulations and they optimize around them. And if it became very unprofitable to be very, very big and very, very, very complex, banks would not become very, very big and very, very complex. Um, I, I think one of the real causes of the financial crisis is the movement of security firms from private partnerships into public corporations. I don't see any reason why security firms should be given the license to operate as public corporations, given the behavior that we've seen. Um, I've been a big proponent of the financial transaction tax. It's a, it's a marvelous tool to build in some of that resiliency um, and also raise some money. Uh, very political issue, but um, that's to me a no-brainer. It's not going to fix a lot of problems, but it's incrementally the right direction. It should be coupled with a modification of the capital gains tax so that we are incentivized to invest in the things we need and not just uh, in, in, in incentivized to invest in one year and one day financial speculation. Uh, we need to regain sovereignty over our financial system. This idea of globalization, I think, is, has gone too far and, and we're in this sort of least common denominator. There's no reason why the Fed can't regulate U.S. banks however any way it wants. And, and other nations, I think, will follow, but we're sort of captured by the uh, Bank of International Settlements negotiations and they're getting watered down and pushed out and, and we should have more courage to do what we need to do uh, for banks in this country and I, and I believe that leadership would be followed around the world. Um, we need to shift the public subsidy that banks now get. There's been a lot of research done on how much uh, 
I mean, this is measured in the billions of dollars by bank, by big bank, and there's no reason we should be subsidizing J.P. Morgan and and uh, and Jamie Dimon's bonus. We should be subsidizing community banks, co-ops, CDFIs, and there's a really interesting movement around public banks um, uh, that's, that's growing. There's an organization promoting the growth of public banking, meaning state-owned banks. There's a very successful state-owned bank in North Dakota that's being used as a model. And of course, in Europe, um, in, in, in Spain, uh, in Switzerland, in Germany, there's lots of state-owned banks. And I think the idea of banking as being a, a uh, not just a business, but a public having a public purpose is much more um, readily understood there. Um, and finally, given the infrastructure needs we have, and I'm not just talking about bridges, I'm talking about the energy system, I see no possible way around this than to have a very significant public sector involvement using the public sector's extremely low cost of capital involved in this multi-decade, multi-trillion dollar investment need, and, and how that gets funded and the taxes and whatnot, that's a whole nother challenge. There has been some uh, interesting work, and, and I'm sure your community is aware of these, the, the, the alternative currencies that are springing up. Um, you know, the Bitcoin is one I don't understand. I, I just throw it out there because it's amazing what's, what's happening, whatever that is. But there are um, legitimate uh, alternative currencies. The most interesting one to me is the VIR in Switzerland. It, it grew out of, um, I believe, soon after the Second World War when the economy was in, in the skids. And it's essentially a um, business to business working capital system. And what's interesting is that when the economy thrives, the use of the VIR recedes. But when the economy is under stress and banks are under stress, the use of this alternative currency expands. So it's a natural, resilient, um, sort of shock absorber, where essentially businesses among themselves provide each other the credit that they need when the banks are stressed. And, and it's a very successful example and long-standing and, and multi-billion Swiss franc scale version of an alternative currency. Another interesting little fact that Bernard Leotard shares is that since, the, since Japan went into um, an economic crisis back in 1990, uh, 600 alternative currencies have sprung up in Japan. So I think these are natural um, stabilizers, um, but, but I don't share the view that they are the solution to the financial system problems we have. I think focusing on the investment lens, through the investment lens, is probably the most important issue for us to focus on. So, in summary, um, this time is different, and, and that's probably the most important thing that we need to get through the heads of the, the financial elite and the regulators and the, and the leaders so we think about the problem, the financial system problem correctly. Um, uh, there is this idea of financial overshoot, I think, which um, there's stormy times ahead, um, but that's okay. Um, we need to really focus on how investment capital flows and, and understand that um, uh, there's, a, there's a public interest in how investment capital flows. And there are all kinds of governance implications of that as well as moral implications of that. And finally, there's obviously a public interest in banking and we need to tackle banking as not just a business that needs to be regulated, but as a business that has a unique public purpose and needs to be managed in, uh, in that context. That's all I have to say. So. <laughs>